Uh, well, welcome everybody. Uh, this is a session on new frontiers in physics. Uh, it's been six years since that glorious day when people walked out at CERN and announced that they had discovered the Higgs boson or the evidence for the Higgs boson. Uh, and uh, I think the Higgs boson decay particle is now uh, I've been seen or evidence for that, or the decay process. But is um, it's it's uncertain really w w where we go from here. At least the public, I think, is uh, maybe a little confused about what's next. And so this is a chance for us to hear from people who are prepared to give us the straight poop, as it were. Um, we have an hour session. Uh, there will be time for questions from the audience. So uh, please. If you have them, we'd be happy to hear them when the time comes. I think we'll probably have a microphone to pass around. And when you have a question, if you wouldn't mind identifying yourself just so we know uh, who we're talking to. So uh, without uh, any other announcements to make, I'll simply introduce our speakers. Uh, to my immediate left is Fabiola Genati. She's the Director General of the European Organization for Nuclear Research, which is better known, I think, as CERN. And uh, as I learned, just become a member of the Board of Trustees of the World Economic Forum. So congratulations on that. And to her left is Wang Yifang, the professor at the Institute of High Energy Physics at the Chinese Academy of Sciences here in the People's Republic of China. So um, Fabiola Giannotti, can I start with you? Um, the frontiers of high energy physics, where are we now? I mean, there's a temptation for science writers to say, we've discovered everything there is to discover, so you can all pack up and go home now. But I don't think that's the case. <laughs> yeah, right. So it's a very, it's a very interesting um, question. First of all, good morning, everyone. Um, so it's a, um, it's a very exciting time for fundamental physics, for particle physics, because as you said correctly, on the one hand, we have the impression that we, well, we, have the, we know that we have learned a lot. So we, um, we essentially, we have a theory um, called the standard model of particle physics that describe the elementary particles that we have observed so far uh, in a very precise and correct way in the sense that all the particles that have been predicted by the standard model have been discovered. These are the particles that make up the ordinary matter of which we are uh, made, electrons and, and quarks. Uh, these are also the particles that uh, transfer the, uh, uh, the interaction, the fundamental interaction at the microscopic level, like the photon that uh, is, is responsible for um, transferring the uh, electromagnetic force. Um, and we have now the X boson, which was the only missing piece of the, um, of the standard model, and is a very special particle because it plays a very important role in the evolution of the universe and also in our... Um, own existence because uh, because it's, it's a very specific role in uh, in uh, you know in the mechanism that gives mass to the elementary particles, which is fundamental for for the uh, evolution of the universe. Um, this theory has been uh, um, verified with very high precision by experiments and facilities across the world at CERN, but also in many other laboratories in the U.S. in in, uh, in Asia, um, and so it works very well. Uh, now, the problem is that this theory, uh, although um, it's, it is correct, is not complete. Uh, not being complete means that there are many open questions out there um, to which the, uh, the standard model is not able to answer. So the, 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 the typical, the template of the question is what we call the dark universe. So to give you the, an idea of the magnitude of the problem, today with the standard model and the theories we know, we understand only 5% of the universe. Uh, the rest is unknown. Uh, made, made, mm, this means it's made of s forms of, uh, of energy and matter <coughs> that cannot be explained with the theories that we have today, with the standard model. Mm -hmm. So, uh, for instance, if you consider dark matter, which is about 25% of the universe, it's called dark because of its our ignorance about its composition, but also dark because it doesn't interact with our instruments. So we deduce its presence from uh, indirect evidence, like gravitational motion of galaxies. Uh, well, there is no single particle in the standard model, no single particle of those that we have discovered so far that can explain the properties of dark matter. So it's, exci it's an exciting time because of course, we scientists, we like very much to understand things, but we are even more happy when we don't understand things. Mm -hmm. 
<coughs> because it means that there is still a lot to, uh, to find. So dark matter, dark energy, uh, matter-antimatter asymmetry in the universe, and many, many other open questions today cannot be simply explained with what we know. So there is a full territory to explore. And also the very exciting things is that there is no single instrument today among those that humanity has developed from accelerator to telescopes, underground detector, etc., that can give us the guarantee to address and answer successfully all the questions. So the only way we have to, um, to, give, to, to understand the mysteries is to deploy um, in parallel all the uh, experimental approaches and all the instruments that we have developed thanks also to strong advances in technology for accelerator, detectors, and other, and other instruments. And that's why also particle physics is becoming more and more global, because we cannot afford you know, building 10 times the same instruments. We need to coordinate across the globe so that we maximize the chances to, um, to address the questions and uh, being able to answer them. OK. Wang Yifeng, do you want to add something to that? Because I think it also asks the question, well, what do we need that doesn't exist right now in terms of facilities. Um, I agree uh, very much what just Fabiola said, uh, what we understood uh, from the standard model and also the existing experimental facts uh, could not uh, coherently and completely describe our universe. And we have a number of issues which cannot be described by the, uh, by the, uh, the standard model. Uh, for example, there is no uh, uh, dark matter particles in the framework of standard model. Uh, we are not able to stand, uh, understand the dark energy. Um, we have a lot of issues like even the mass of Higgs itself, we don't understand it very well. So there are a number of issues we have to, uh, we have to address using the new uh, instruments. So uh, I think uh, uh, the globe, it is now uh, uh, the time for us to think globally and, uh, and also to coordinate globally that we go uh, different approaches and try different road and try uh, in the end to find uh, uh, the, the, the final solutions. So no one can tell which one is the only right one. So we have to try all the different approaches. <clears throat> so I, I should say, I, I forgot to introduce myself. I'm Joe Palka. I'm a reporter for NPR. and. Um, at National Public Radio, it's a radio network in the United States. And the question from what you just said is, when you have to talk to people, because I have to talk to people who don't know anything about the high energy physics world, and, they, and, and the question they always ask me is, why is this important? Why do we have to spend so much money to answer these questions? What, what, is this the best thing we should be spending our money on? So how, how do you, you must be faced those questions as well. How do you answer them? It's the first time. Really? Yeah, like, oh, OK. <laughs> <laughs> well, that was clever of me then, really. <laughs> yeah. That's really good. Well, I mean, uh, I'm not sure my answer is, uh, is ideal, it's perfect, it's, uh, it's correct, but I try my best. Uh, uh, very often, we have to face, uh, as you said, uh, government officials, funding agencies, uh, uh, general public, uh, journalists, and so on. So we have to explain why uh, uh, we want to go this way and why we need to spend this money on the uh, pure science uh, uh, projects. So I think, uh, first of all, uh, I think a science dream is really uh, uh, take us to a new stage. I think the human beings, uh, if you don't have a science dreams, if you don't have the the, the, the kind of driving force of, to force you to look for something new, uh, as a human being, we're not going to move forward. I think in, in, the, in the last the thousands of years, we managed to end up here is because we have our dreams. So I think we should not lose this kind of dreams. And secondly, of course, when you understand something, uh, you may try to use, uh, you may try to use it. Uh, but this is not our, uh, the first goal. Uh, but as a byproduct, in the end, you were benefit from this kind of uh, 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 discoveries, uh, new uh, technology tools, and, uh, and so on. And thirdly, I think the, uh, this kind of large science project, which could uh, unite the effort 
by, uh, by all the countries, all different people, is actually a good way for, for peace, for, uh, for global benefit, and also for uh, training of the young scientists. Because um, the innovation for the society uh, very much should come from the young talent with uh, great, uh, complete new ideas, not just progressively. And this kind of uh, uh, great young talent uh, should be trained in some way, or at least a fresh fraction of them come from the, uh, the basic science. Uh, they are looking for something which is not for immediate use. Otherwise, we're not going to uh, have really great jumps uh, for our society. So I think a good training of the people with, uh, with dreams is also one of the main goals for such, uh, for such a, a science project. Well, I can only stress what, uh, is it working? Yes. yes. What Ifang just said, I think there are, there are many, many aspects. One is the fact that as, uh, as knowledge is one of the highest uh, aspiration as uh, for, you know, uh, human being as clever being. So we have a brain, and of course, uh, you know, the thirst for knowing, for knowing more, for exploring, and for understanding has been with us since uh, since uh, human beings are, are are on earth. It's like like the arts. It's the same thing. Are we going to say we don't fund the arts, music, concerts, uh, museums because, you know, it's useless in terms of practical life. <laughs> so that's the first thing. We have the right and the duty of knowing, more, learning more and more. The second thing is that looking at the impact on, on society, fundamental research is usually the one that brings, uh, the, brings us, uh, as history shows, the, the most important breakthroughs. Uh, of course, it takes time. Sometimes it takes decades. It's not, it's, it does not have an impact, immediate impact like applied science, because applied research targets a given product, so it's usually as a faster cycle. Fundamental science sometimes takes decades, but the, the disruption of the breakthroughs are obvious, enormous. So the, the, the example that everybody takes is the example of quantum mechanics and general relativity. When they were developed, they were considered to be useless knowledge because they were very far away from even, the, you know, from our normal world because they have to do with a very small world, microscopic world, and so quantum mechanics has not, some of the phenomena are really odd for, for our day-by-day -day life or the, 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 the scale of the universe. And yet, we know very well that without quantum mechanics, modern electronics will not exist. But I think I would like to stress is that uh, the fathers of these great discoveries, theoretical discoveries of last century, so if you take Einstein, Heisenberg, Planck, Bohr, etc., were not trying to develop new electronics, were not trying to develop GPS. They were trying to understand how the universe works. And so it's very, very important that while we uh, support applied research, and uh, which is of course very fine. We also don't miss tomorrow's Einstein and tomorrow's Heisenberg. We don't because we don't fund fundamental research. No, it's interesting, and uh, but they also, it's those are interesting examples because Einstein didn't need any real equipment, <laughs> very little. <laughs> because he was a theorist. Yes, yeah. right, exactly. You are right. You are right. But 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 then, you know, what what he develop quantum mechanics at the end entail then some, uh, uh, you know, it triggers some studies, then, then in, over time required equipment and required people Absolutely. and required resources. So it's... Uh, no, it's, it's theorists. A, theorists, are, they can throw out anything. It's up to the experimentalists to say whether they're right or not. But I didn't. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> but but I, I actually, I have an announcement to make. This is, a, this is very exciting. Um, I've been putting my pennies away for the uh, last... 25 years as a journalist, and I've now amassed $600 billion, which I am prepared to give to you. To him or to, to you? No, to him. <laughs> I'll, I'll give you a 600 next. Six, $600 billion for you to use f to make the next instrument or hire the next generator. 600 billion? Or billion. No, billion. I'm, billion. I'm giving you, this is, I've been really frugal. <laughs> <laughs> so, so, I, so, but I'm giving it all away because I, 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 I'm so impressed with what you guys have said so far, and I want to know how you're going to spend the money. What would you do um, with that kind of windfall? Well, six billion is a lot. It's the no, way. No, six hundred. 
Six hundred billion. Yeah, it's it's, it's even, a lot. Even more a lot. It's uh, <laughs> well, I mean, uh, it's uh, it's more than what we have dreamed ever. <laughs> <laughs> well. Well, I mean, certainly uh, uh, with a fraction of it, we would like to build uh, instruments to understand the universe and the particles. This is extremely small and, they, uh, and, and the infinitely large part of the, of, uh, of the world around Earth. So, so we think that we should build, say, telescopes, uh, uh, satellites, uh, large accelerators, and so on, and try to understand the uh, the inner structure of the matter, I try to understand the universe, and try to look for dark matters, and try to understand the dark energy, and so on. I think 600 billion is really a, um, a lot. And if you, if you really can give, us, give me a fraction of it, I'll be extremely happy. <laughs> <laughs> but but, but I, I'm, what I'm trying, I'm doing, being silly, of course, but I'm asking, is there a thing that you would like to build? Is there a educational system you would like to inaugurate? Is there, is there something that that money would allow you to do that you can't do now? Because all those things are happening that, that you just described. They're just not happening perhaps as fast as they would if I could give you $600 billion. Well, I mean, this moment, with the one proposal we are actually working on is a large accelerator with a circumference of 100 kilometers. And this accelerator is going to produce millions of Higgs and try to understand its uh, properties in, the, in a great detail and try to look for hints for uh, uh, evidence which is uh, not being able to describe by the current standard model. And this machine only need uh, a percent of your six billion, so it'd mm -hmm. be great if you can give me well, that. Uh, <laughs> Well, okay, so uh, would you also build a bigger machine or? So first of all, I think it's very important to, uh, to put the money in, uh, in developing the technologies because if you give me all the money now and I cannot build, you know, the dream accelerator <coughs> uh, now. We, we, we need the time to develop the technologies and we need the people. So money means uh, being able to have more people, to, to grow a new generation of, of scientists and engineers, physicists, etc., and also being able to uh, move fast with the technology, which, by the way, also have an impact on society. As we said before, I think that uh, we need to build a, a, a set of complementary instruments to attack the big question in fundamental physics in a complementary way. So it could be telescopes, it could be interferometer for gravitational wave studies, could be accelerator. Of course, I am a particle physicist and I believe that accelerators will continue to play a leading role also in the future. It will not be the only instrument, it will not be the leading role, but it will be a leading role. So uh, I, I would invest the money in that direction. But technology is the key word in all respect, uh, for, for accelerator, for detectors, for computing. What about computational uh, uh, questions? Because yes. there's a lot of data that um, is maybe overwhelming to current technologies in terms of yeah, computer so that, science. So. Yeah, yeah. yeah, so that's why I, I mentioned computing, not only in terms of hardware resourcing and developing, the, but also new computational, computational methods. And, uh, and there, again, we need the people. Uh, it's, uh, it's also educating new computer scientists, and of course people talk today about uh, artificial intelligence, machine learning, etc. But behind that there are human brains, but behind that there are people who have to push the technology. So, uh, so I think that uh, we, will, we will find a way to use your 600 billion. <laughs> All right, good. Well, okay, now that, now that we've agreed that there's things you could do with the money, um, and since I'm afraid I just got a notification that my stock portfolio has crashed and so I don't have the 600 billion anymore. <laughs> um, how, do you, how, do you, uh, how do you do that? As you said, no one country, it seems, can do that anymore. So how do you build these international relationships that allow countries to get together? Well, first of all, you need to have a great goal and your science uh, program should be attractive. And once it's... Uh, uh, understood by all the scientists in the world that this is a great science project and they will come. And of course then uh, they have to uh, convince their government to take their money to a particular country mm -hmm. to use all together. So I think then of course there are politics, uh, politics involved 
And in this sense, I think CERN is a great example that it was very successful in the last 60 years to bring the international money into, uh, into uh, one place to uh, one project. So I think this is a model, and we should all try to uh, uh, use a similar way, not the exact uh, same uh, 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 CERN way of doing things, but a very similar kind of uh, approach so that we could uh, work together. I think a particle physics uh, community have this kind of tradition, uh, have the uh, kind of uh, understanding how to do this. So we... You, you said not exactly the CERN way. What, what do you think has to change, or is there some specific thing? Uh, CERN is an organization, and uh, uh, there are certain things which are probably only uh, suitable for, say, European countries. This is a, a lot of uh, uh, European, uh, quote-unquote, smaller countries. Mm -hmm. And in the, world, in, the, in the future, if we are going to build something new for a big project, say if we would like to bring uh, Japan, uh, uh, United States, and all the European countries together, I think the model probably would be slightly different. And uh, people may only interest in the project, not the institution. But CERN is really an institution. So I think in the future, there may be different interests, different ways. But I think the key is, that we have the same science goals, we want to work together, and I think we particle physicists are clever enough to invent a mechanism to, uh, to reach our goals. Yeah. Well, yeah, but we, are already exp we've already made a good step forward toward this, uh, this model. For instance, at CERN, we, as you know, we, we run the Large Hadron Collider, which is the, the most powerful accelerator. And of course, most of the budget, uh, most, most of the, you know, the funding for this project came from the CERN budget, from CERN member states, so mainly European. But there have been important contributions to the project coming from the US and from Japan, for instance. So um, clearly, uh, I think that we, there is, a lot of, uh, there is a lot of discussion already in the community, and we are aware of the, of the challenges ahead. I'm saying the community, particle physics community, worldwide, globally. And so, for instance, at CERN now we are running what we call the high energy frontier instruments, the Large Hadron Collider, but Japan and, uh, and the US are concentrating on other topics like the study of the neutrinos, which are very intriguing and interesting particles. So uh, at CERN we don't do any neutrino physics, but we collaborate with this, those countries on their project and vice versa, they collaborate with us on the energy frontier. And so uh, likewise with China for future projects. So uh, I think that we, we, we clearly understand that the next step is to be really global. Yeah, I just, uh, as you were talking though, I was, I was thinking that it's very hard to tell a politician you have to share <laughs> and play nice with others because they, every, every politician that I know wants to take credit for anything that uh, he or she is able to generate in terms of funding. So is it, is it doable? I mean, you've had a lot yes. of experience with that. What do you tell, what, how do you tell them it's, it's a yeah. joint effort? Yeah, it is because, uh, you know, uh, studying the neutrinos is not less exciting than studying the energy frontier. So if every big region, say Europe, Asia, and, uh, and the uh, Americas have their big instrument or their important instrument, then it's easier to, to, to share. See what I mean? Yeah, no, I understand. So I'm still, I'm still, I mean, okay, so we need a workforce. We need new, some new tools. W what do we do in the meantime? I mean, prepare for that or, I mean, there's, a, there's a lot of research going on now, as of you course, say. Yeah. So, so what, what can we expect to hear in the next five years from that research? Or is this one of those things where if we knew what to expect, we wouldn't be doing it? Uh, I think we just have to develop proposals and develop technologies and, uh, and uh, train young people and try to be ready for the next the big project. I think it is right now a turning point. We completed uh, the discovery of the, all the particles in the standard model, and now we need to look for a way to go to the next step. So uh, uh, it is uh, probably a little bit bigger pause and then we go ahead with a big jump. Well, at the moment, uh, of course, uh, in particular at CERN, but there are many other um, facilities in the world looking at complementary 
um, aspects. At CERN, we are running the LHC, and we are doing essentially along two different lines. First of all, uh, understanding the X boson better and better. Uh, it was only, disco only discovered six years old, so it's a small child. Uh, it's not as well known as the other particles. It's also a very special particle, as I, as I mentioned before. It's not a matter particle. It's not a particle um, responsible for uh, transmitting the interaction at the fundamental level. It's a particle that is related to the way uh, elementary particles acquire mass. Uh, so we believe that this particle can be a door into new physics, it's the new physics that may explain dark matter, dark energy, and all the nice things that we mentioned before. So we need to understand it in great detail. And we made a lot of progress over the past six years. We know it much better, but we need to improve this, this precision. And at the same time, we are searching, in parallel, we are searching for manifestation of this new physics that may help us to um, answer the, 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 the open question. In the meantime, we are already thinking about the future facilities because the lead time is, is very long for this experiment. So to give you an idea, the first discussion about uh, the opportunity and, 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 and the physics opportunities and the challenges of the Large Hadron Collider took place in the early 80s, 84 or so, in a famous workshop you know, in Lausanne. People started to brainstorm. And operation of the LHC started in earnest in 2010, and physics exploitation will end in 2037. So it's really, you know, a 50-year-long project. So it's not too early to think about the next facility, which means developing the physics goals, the physics opportunities, the physics motivation, and in parallel, the technologies. I want to ask one historical question and then one stupid question about the science, because I, I love asking stupid questions. And then I'd like to open it up to everybody who's in the room to ask questions. But the historical question was, is, what was the effect on the field when the United States canceled the superconducting supercollider? What, what did that do to high energy physics? Um, I think it's a disaster. Um, it sent a very wrong uh, message to the community. Uh, somebody misunderstood that science, uh, or that particular science, is not uh, great. Mm -hmm. And uh, secondly, uh, this kind of large science facility is uh, very difficult, very risky, and can easily fail. So I think these will discourage people to go ahead to come up with new projects, to come up with uh, great ideas. So um, I think th that was a big mistake. Um, we, uh, uh, we should learn from it. I think a lot of uh, the U.S. particle physicists, now also the whole world learned from that. So once you have a great ideas, no matter how difficult it is, you just have to go ahead. Yeah. I, should, I should just add, does everybody in the room know what the superconducting super collider is? It was a giant project that is partially built. 87 kilometer right. of 40 TV. 87 kilometer ring. Um, I can't answer for everybody watching around the world on the internet. So if you don't but know what that is, you'll have, <coughs> at least you're on a computer, you can go look it up. Yeah. Um, but it was dramatic. But also was also as we have to also to take a, to look at the positive side of it. Uh, the U.S. physicists were active and uh, building the SSC. Uh, then came and joined the, the Large Hadron Collider. So it was really then it was. We, 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 it was a very important step forward toward international collaboration. It's thanks also to that that we have now this very, very fruitful collaboration with the U.S. And, with, and, with, and this reciprocity. They are working with us. We are working with them uh, on their project. So uh, it, at, at the end, it boosted international collaboration. Right. Hmm. But uh, If you're talking about money, and I don't want to give a few numbers because the people will say SSC was too expensive, but it's, uh, blah, blah. So SSC was proposed uh, roughly at about a uh, $4 billion uh, price tag. It ended up something like $8 billion, and the people believe that they need a total of roughly $10 billion at that time. So they spent $2 billion and they closed down. If they insist, uh, they probably had to put down $8 billion at that time. And if they manage to finish, the U.S. now would have a SSC collider. They probably have to start covered a bit long before the LHC, mm -hmm. the Higgs particles. Uh, probably in the 90s, they already have the Higgs particles. Uh, and then and now it is time for them to do the upgrade of the machine. They go to uh, the, from a 40 TV, they may go to a, 
100 TV now with the existing turnout. So the, the whole field is going to be very different if at that time the U.S. could spend a, a, a few billion dollars extra. If you think it now, it's a bargain. Mm. There's a, there, you're reminding me that the same equation, the same discussion is going on in the United States about the James Webb Space Telescope, which has exceeded its cost and delayed its actually implementation. But I, I imagine, I mean, there's a lot of expectations about what that will show to answer some of these fundamental questions. And yet, uh, it's, it seems like it's, I don't know, when I use the expression too big to fail, but it's, it's built. So it'd sort of be a shame not to do something with it, but it's going to take a while to get it ready but, to do something. But this also uh, essentially is a very good, uh, very good lesson for the fact that these big projects really need uh, sustained funding over decades. And CERN, the European model of CERN, is successful because the member states, 64 years ago, the member states committed to this organization, and since then they have given us a, a constant budget with which we are build, building the Large Hadron Collider, etc. So sustaining, sustained funding is fundamental for big instruments and for big science. Well, political winds don't always, aren't always comfortable with accepting whatever previous commitments were made by other administrations. So that's a, a, whole, a, a session which I'm not going to host. Thank you very much. <laughs> um, here's the dumb question. You said that uh, the material that you're studying represents a, approximately 5% of what is out there. How do we know what that fraction is? Oh, we know it pretty well. Uh, nowadays, thanks to a lot of uh, experimental work made in particular by uh, satellites or uh, uh, instruments looking at the, at the universe, and um, in particular, uh, looking to what is called um, cosmic microwave background. So, well, there are several uh, demonstrations of dark energy and dark matter coming from the supernova, coming from, uh, from um, gravitational motion of galaxies. But the precise numbers come in particular from mapping the residual, uh, say, uh, radiation from the Big Bang. And we are able to do so and looking at this tiny temperature variation which have to do with the, uh, with the fluctuation in the original distribution of matter at the time of the few years after the Big Bang by uh, using these instruments. And this gives us the knowledge of dark matter and dark energy with quite uh, precise uh, numbers, I mean, at the level of a few percent. So, I mean, but is there any possibility that the calculation is based on the notion that the Big Bang is what... Of course, Big there Bang. Is. If maybe something else... Well, yeah, uh, it's possible there are theories, for instance, so-called theory, and I don't want to go into, uh, into technical details of emerging gravity theories, for instance, that argue that uh, dark matter and dark energy are only the results of our poor understanding of gravity large distance, distances, okay? So these theories now are subject to the scrutiny of the community, and they're not able, apparently, to reproduce this uh, cosmic microwave background data. So it's, uh, it's a very interesting, uh, it's a very interesting uh, time, and it's a very interesting debate in the scientific world. So it's, it's, it's a frustrating thing, I think, for high energy physics, because you get a few centimeters below the surface in a discussion, and automatically you're very complicated. So it's, it's, hard to, it's hard to bring the discussion in, into any depth because to go deep, you have to have a much deeper knowledge than most people have. So I, I appreciate you guys are trying uh, and helping, doing a great job, but it's always a little frustrating that in the end, we have to take your word for it because <laughs> <laughs> we don't really have any way to, to know, we, the public. Well, I did say uh, I would entertain questions from the audience and... We have one here in the front, and if you wait for the microphone, this gentleman here, uh, and if you don't mind saying who you are, it'd be nice to know that. Okay, so hi, um, my name is Pedro Ochoa. I'm from Chile, and I work in particle physics. And um, I, I'm an optimist. I, I think that new physics is right beyond the corner, but I still think it's perhaps good to ask a somewhat tough question. What will be the impact on the field of particle physics? What will be the impact on CERN if 
the LHC finds uh, nothing new beyond the, the standard model Higgs. Um, will it be possible, feasible, to convince funding agencies to give us money to build a next generation uh, machine that will cover new energies? Um, what's your outlook on, on that? Well, uh, I am even more optimist than, than you, and I think that uh, even if we don't discover this work, yes, yeah. new physics, I think that we will manage to convince the politician. If you, are, if you manage to convince everyone that science is not always discovery. Already discovering the X boson has been a very important step forward for humanity. We understand when uh, the X mechanism uh, started to be active in the universe, in the, in, the, in the history of the universe, what are the consequences also for us being here. So this is a monumental discovery, okay? Now, uh, the LHC, even if it doesn't discover new physics, it will make a huge number of precise measurements and, and, and it will contribute in a very fundamental way to uh, improve our understanding of particle physics and the fundamental interaction and will also give us indication of where to go because not discovering new physics allow us to discard some theories that have been very popular and very uh, supported <coughs> for decades and they are off. So, um, so it's very really important to, sh to, 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 to give the message that science is not just discovery. Discoveries, of course, are glamorous and they make you know, the, the front page of the newspapers, but science go ahead by little steps, with a lot of patience, with a lot of day-by-day -day work, which is as important as discoveries, even if less glamorous. So I think this is the, the, the message. And the next discovery is prepared by the very deep work of measurement that the previous machines have, have been doing. So I, I think the, um, even if we don't find anything at the HC, but we still gain the, uh, the knowledge because we know where is the, the place, the uh, standard model, the current models uh, still works in this energy range, and we know that where the uh, new physics is going to start. So we know where the boundary is between the existing standard model and the new physics, approximately, of course. I think there was a question here. Thank you for that. Thank you. Um, I'm curious, kind of building on your last question there, Joe, would, could you um, maybe highlight one area or group or kind of um, area of research, maybe outside of your own institutions, that kind of most excites you right now? Research outside? Well, it depends on what you mean uh, outside your field. Uh, if no, you... outside, of your, outside of CERN, for instance. Ah, so yes, for instance, well, clearly, uh, clearly neutrino physics. Is, uh, is very exciting for me, it's very intriguing, this particle that interact very weakly, they can cross the earth without interacting. We know, uh, you know, we discovered um, 20 years ago now that uh, neutrino have masses, they transform in, uh, into different species, and this was a great break breakthrough, which also brought to Nobel Prize. And um, this is, uh, these particles are really intriguing. We don't understand them well, and they, again, as the Higgs boson, they are, a, 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 um, a door in, for, for to new physics. So this is an example. Gravitational waves, another example. Understanding, you know, uh, the macrostructure of the universe. So this is another on the on the on the large side of the spectrum. Thank you. So I personally think that the uh, uh, cosmic microwave background is a great field. Um, uh, although there are already uh, two Nobel Prize awarded to this kind of experiments, I think still there are rooms for the future. And, uh, and uh, it will help us to understand the origin of, uh, of the universe when the uh, uh, Big Bang just started and uh, how this inflation uh, uh, really happened, uh, the really how it worked. Yes, there's some questions over here. Uh, my name is Chu Gao. I graduated from University of Science and Technology of China from Modern Physics Department. Uh, historians, uh, some historians say that scientific revolution really started uh, when Tycho Brahe uh, built his instruments and uh, uh, watched the sky and led to Kepler's uh, three laws of planet motion and, and later on everything else. And obviously, uh, you know, uh, his equipment is no longer there, right? Uh, but, you know, if you, uh, you know, the audience, you, you, you go to Beijing airport, if you drive on the second ring road, 
uh, when you arrive at Jian Guomen, when you, when you pay attention, you will see a lot of equipment. Uh, actually, you can see uh, on, on the road uh, from the Chinese Imperial Observer. And those equipment are actually commissioned by Qing emperors. And uh, they were built by Jesuits because they brought the book and showed the emperor, you know, these are the equipment. So the equipment are copies of what Tycho Brahe has done. So if you're interested, you can actually see. So there is a tradition of Chinese building expensive scientific uh, instruments. So my first question to Professor Wang is, you know, how's the Beijing cyclotron project, how'd it go? So, so uh, 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 you know, the, the second question is, the Chinese society is now uh, very excited about quantum entanglement, right? So there's a lot of discussions uh, uh, among the people. And also, ch uh, China also launched the uh, uh, quantum satellite. And uh, so I think it's, it's, it's easier to think that these, you know, quantum in entanglement is done in a laboratory uh, type of uh, framework, but it's kind of hard to imagine these things can be done uh, 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 on a satellite and, and, and those kind of things. So how much is it science? How much is it really uh, some other stuff? This is also prof Professor Wang. And can uh, I, uh, just so we can, maybe some people, A, don't know about the, uh, accelerator that he's asking about, so maybe you can just talk a little bit about that. And, and B, I'm going to make you talk about what quantum entanglement is <laughs> and why it's interesting and why you would want to study it. So, um, We are going to build a Beijing uh, synchrotron radiation facility in the north of Beijing. Uh, it's, uh, it's a 1.3 kilometers uh, circumference uh, electron accelerator. Uh, the project is going to uh, start probably by the end of this year. For the quantum entanglement, uh, I'm not really an expert of it, but I think it's a, it's a very important field. And of course, uh, the science itself is the quantum mechanics. It's already, already known. Uh, the, uh, the, the technology and, 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 and the way how to use quantum entanglement. I think there's a, a lot of things uh, to be studied. Now, let me go on to this side <coughs> over here. All right. Um, my name is Praneha Narang. I'm on the faculty at Harvard, and I, I find this conversation very interesting. I, I think the uh, previous question uh, about quantum entanglement really kind of set me up for this. So I'm a theorist who thinks about where we can take quantum technologies, and I found it interesting that in the conversation we've been drawing a very uh, sharp line between fundamental work and applied technologies. And I was wondering if you could comment on everything in between, which is really the work of most people who identify as applied scientists, uh, where we think about some things that are really high risk and, and pie in the sky, and some things that are maybe more uh, three to five years. Um, how should we be talking with, say, funding agencies? It should we be promising them that, hey, everything I do will, will bear fruit in five years. It's going to be great. Or should we actually, uh, you know, give them this, this, the reality that some things will pan out and some things won't? And, and really, with your experience working with these big projects, how do you uh, address those questions? Okay, that was more questions than I intended to ask. <laughs> Yeah, so um, if I understand well your question, I think first, first of all, as I said at the beginning, of course, there, are, there is uh, both applied science giving you know, benefits in the short term and most fundamental research that may give fruits in, in decades. They are both important. They have, should be both pursued. Of course, industry usually is more um, prone to finance uh, applied science in their fields. Okay? So fundamental research is usually not funded by Private, by the private sector, but by governments, okay, because it's longer term, okay. Now, we should not give them, I hope I didn't give the impression, we didn't give the impression that what we do has nothing to do with applied science and technologies, because, you know, uh, the instruments that we build are really monster of technology. They are extremely complex, you know, the, the Large Hadron Collider is a 27 kilometer ring filled with, uh, you know, a state of the heart superconducting magnets, which require developing cryogenic superconducting material and, and vacuum technology, etc. So I didn't mention the benefits, what, what we call the secondary benefits of fundamental research, 
One is, of course, the, the primary benefits. You discover something, you discover quantum mechanics, you have an impact in 20 or 30 years from now on a society. But in order to, to, to discover uh, the Higgs boson or to discover you know, the, the goal of your fundamental research, you need very, very complicated instruments nowadays. Nowadays, uh, fundamental research at all levels, big science, small science, tabletop, big accelerator, telescopes require very, very complex instruments. And those instruments then, in turn, require the development of new technologies in many, many fields. So in some sense, we also do applied science. Okay, so th there is a very, very uh, close, there are very, very close links. Although the goal is not an application, the goal is a fundamental research, discovering the X boson, discovering dark matter, discovering dark energy, but at the same time, we do a lot of applied science. Computing is another field. You want to add anything to that? Okay. Yes, sir, in the back. Hello, thank you. Um, I was really struck by three things that you've said so far. First, you talked about how science is a great motivator for inspiration, for creativity. Two, you talked about collaboration, how science can bring you know, different countries together. Yeah, yeah. And then you also uh, talked a little bit about the scientific method where I basically heard you say, when there's a problem you don't have a solution to, you get excited. Yes. Mm -hmm. And you're talking about how science invites skepticism, it invites facts in, even if they don't conform uh, to what you, you think might be true. My question for you is, I know that most scientists also like spending time in the lab and usually enjoy interacting with their problems maybe more than getting out on the, the stage. But what role, if any, do you think scientists might play that they're not playing today to get this kind of thinking outside of the lab? And this, this scientific process of being more collaborative, being more curious, being more open to having your assumptions challenged. Since we're at the World Economic Forum, mm. uh, it seems an appropriate question. Yeah, excellent question. Do you want to answer? Uh, yes, I think this is really a very good question. And uh, uh, most people think that uh, scientists just working in their, in their lab. And this is actually uh, a large fraction of scientists uh, working this way. Uh, but nowadays, really, uh, more and more, we have uh, scientists working in a different way, globally, uh, working together. And this also had more impact in society and also gives scientists an uh, opportunity to uh, talk to different people and talk to the, the society, government, and so on, to tell them a different uh, way of, of doing things. And also by doing this, you actually uh, not only spread out the, the knowledge of science and also tell people uh, uh, the method of, of scientific research and also the spirit of the, of, of the science. So uh, uh, yes, I think uh, we, uh, we see uh, more and more scientists doing this way, but we probably have to do more. And also go to public more towards, say, media, uh, and so on, and uh, and, and the schools, and try to uh, to do more uh, toward this direction. If I can just, yeah, sure. I, I agree fully with what uh, Ifang said. Just to <coughs> complement a bit, I think it's very important. I think I'm really I'm really uh, supporting and uh, promoting and arguing that. Uh, a minimum educational, uh, scientific education is fundamental for everyone. Uh, no matter what you choose to do in life um, afterwards, um, in terms of critical thinking, problem solving, etc. So, um, it's, as, as I Fang, as Fang said, it's very important that we scientists are more open to talk, and really, we, we, we are the dialogue with society is really enhanced. Not only because what we do belongs to everyone, not only because we are funded from public money, but also because. Science nowadays has also aspects related to, as we mentioned, international collaboration and uh, solving problems, etc., and creativity that are very important values for society. I would like to bring one example. Uh, at CERN, uh, we, as I mentioned perhaps at the beginning, we, we attract something like 17,000 um, physicists mainly from all over the world. And about 50% of them are young people. Young people mean PhD students and young postdocs. Uh, typically, only 10% of them remain in research in particle physics. 90% go elsewhere, and about 50% go to the private sector. Uh, so 
we also have, first of all, the, the mission of educating the young people not only for research. We feel the responsibility of educating them for any walk of life and, and society. And recently we made a poll, a uh, sondage with, uh, with, 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 with these young people who left the field, and uh, we asked them if their experience at CERN was, was useful to find the current job, and more than 90% of them said that it was you know, there, what we lear they, they learned at CERN was useful or very useful to find uh, a job at the level of their expectation and, and, and talent. But at the same time, they rank the, the skills that they learn at, at CERN as A, okay, what they learn first, computing, of course. You know, this is very important for everyone. And then international collaboration, collaborating with people from all over the world, creativity, problem solving capabilities, and then working under pressure, because we are specialists in working <laughs> under pressure. <laughs> so you see creativity, uh, collaboration, and, you know, thinking, you know, critical thinking, being able, for instance, you know, nowadays we talk a lot about fake news, okay? <laughs> Do we have the method, we have the tools to understand the difference? The scientific method, these are really the, the primary thing they learn. I, I would add that they learn how to deal with bureaucracy. Because that's, that's an important question, yes. too, in the back, standing up. Hi, I'm Po Shen Lo. I'm on the faculty at Carnegie Mellon University. Um, I'm also actually the national coach of the U.S. Math Olympiad team. And about this, this, I have a question about your talent pipeline. Because I've observed that the most talented quantitative high school students in the United States now predominantly are choosing, if they choose... Uh, these fields to do, for example, computer science instead of mathematics. For example, when I, uh, sorry, instead of, instead of physics, sorry, when I was at Caltech about 20 years ago, I wanted to study computer science and it wasn't a major, so I studied math and physics. Today at Caltech, 50% of the undergraduates are studying computer science. So it looks, this, this phenomenon started about five years ago, so it looks like there will be a significant decrease in the talent of a number of people who are interested in pursuing physics at the high level. Um, First of all, is this a phenomenon that you've noticed as it hit you guys? And second of all, what, what can you do to try to convince more of these young people that physics might be something to focus on? Go ahead. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, uh, so I agree with you, yes and no. So, so say, uh, first of all, we have to be um, to be a little bit careful, because sometimes there are waves in the, in the, um, among the, the young generation. There are periods where everybody studies medicine, periods where everybody goes, is attracted by computing science, etc. So there have been phases like that. For instance, we saw an impact on uh, um, the, the fraction of uh, physics students in Europe following the discovery of the Higgs boson. It went up. <coughs> now, I don't know, perhaps it goes down, and then gravitational waves, and then it goes up again. <coughs> but it's true that we have to attract more people. So how do we attract them? Well, you know, one of the ways of attracting them, and this is the, something that we always discuss with governments, is to make sure that people who want to do, for instance, research in physics do have the possibility of having a career, that there are enough jobs. Because, of course, computing science, you. you a young person think, okay, if I, even if I can, cannot continue any research, I will find a, a, a job in industry. Physics, usually people want to do research because it's more on the, you know, on, 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 on looking for the big question, etc. So the, the most important thing is to uh, really find the, uh, funding uh, the jobs for the young people in all countries. I see that there are, of course, more, more virtuous countries that have more, more employment for researchers in physics other countries that are not so, so well advanced in that respect. But really, we have to push for, for, for having jobs in research for the young generation. I think this is fundamental. I just to add one point. I think that very often the media plays a very important role in this kind of uh, aspects. Uh, one thing I find sometimes a little bit uh, 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 worrisome and, uh, and, uh, and uh, troublesome is that uh, very often in the media, uh, a scientist, a uh, particular physicist, are described as the one who works uh, 24 hours a day, uh, seven days a week, and so on. Oh. <laughs> very often, <laughs> I mean, kind of. So no, um, they don't enjoy their life. So it yeah, frightened right. the young people to, to, to join us. So indeed, I think we should tell our young people how enjoyable uh, 
the life of, uh, of a physicist. Indeed, we, we do enjoy our uh, life absolutely. as a physicist. <laughs> <laughs> yes, we are happy. Wait for the microphone. Uh, follow up on that. Um, my name is Ken Fan. I was trained in mathematics from Columbia University many years ago. <coughs> and I'm not doing other silly things. Anyhow, my question is, uh, uh, historically, a lot of physic, uh, breakthroughs in physics are uh, based on mathematical theories, like uh, Romanian geometry, uh, uh, a Riemannian geometry ahead of uh, Einstein's uh, relativity. So my question is, uh, what, what are the existing mathematical theories or any branches are catching the imagination of leading physicists these days? Not just particle physics, but in general. Thank you. That's a tough question. Uh, for me, it's on. Um, so first of all, I would like to, man to, to, to make a little bit of comment on your... Uh, it's true that, of course, many breakthrough come from, from theory, but then you need the instruments first to verify the theory is correct. But then look at gravitational waves. Now, uh, the instruments are important to study the gravitational waves as messenger to understand the cosmos and to improve our understanding of the universe. So there has always been a hand-to-hand, uh, you know, um, path between theory and, and, and experiments. And so now by studying the Higgs boson with uh, great precision, we can discover new phenomena. So it's uh, breakthroughs come from both theory and, and experiment. Concerning theory, you know, what theory, you know, excite people, it's a, it's a matter of taste. For me, for instance, uh, you know, any theory that attempts to unify uh, gravity with a fundamental microscopic interaction, or standard model interaction, like string theories are clearly interesting and appealing. For me, theoretically, the big question is now how to um, unify uh, the forces, the fundamental forces. Is there a yeah. particular field? No. Okay. Um, going back and forth. Yes, sir. Hi, I'm Michael Nemec. I'm a pro professor of physics at Cornell University, and I study the cosmic microwave background. Uh, one comment, I guess, is we're actually seeing it both in growth, lots of growth in computer science, but also in our physics major undergraduate program substantially, simultaneously. So it's not there at least <laughs> pulling away from uh, the physics uh, undergraduates. My question is related to the comment earlier about fundamental research not being done in the private sector, which I agree with. Although historically, I think more has been done. For example, the cosmic microwave background was discovered at Bell Laboratories. Yes. And I'm wondering if you have any thoughts about how we might encourage more fundamental research or cooperation with the private sector uh, in the future. I think we didn't do a good job, at least in China. Uh, I think the US is actually much better. There are a lot of uh, foundations uh, which support the basic science. Uh, the Simons Foundation and, and the Kabli and all of this. But we don't have uh, anyone in China. I mean, the, 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 the entrepreneurs, they, uh, they, uh, they are more interested in uh, applied uh, kind of science or donations for uh, for schools, education, and so on, but not for pure science. So uh, I think we need to uh, to do more and try to convince people that science is really the the future, and uh, we need uh, uh, more, say, private sector to be part of it. They are part of it in the sense that, of course. Uh, uh, when we build these big instruments, at the end, they are built by industry. And we have a very strong <coughs> partnership because usually what we do, we develop prototypes in-house together with the industry, and we learn together. And then once the, pro the prototype is mature enough, then the construction goes to industry. So there is a, a strong partnership, but more on the instruments, on the applied part than on the, on the X boson, for instance. <laughs> I don't think we have uh, actually time for another question, so I'm going to add um, just my observations of what we've learned, which, are, which is that even though there are not the kind of flashy discoveries that are waiting to be plucked off the tree and 
presented to the world that's waiting, there are still um, a lot of uh, important basic research that's going to go on that's going to improve our understanding of the universe. And I was very struck by something you said early on about people not asking, well, what's the value of a piece of art or uh, a piece of music? There is a human uh, need, desire to understand our world and exactly. its exploration. And I think this world that you're part of is a little bit opaque, but still so fundamental. It's sort of like saying, why are we here? Exactly. And I think that kind of... Where are we going? Where are we going? Why are we here? Why do we exist? Why didn't we blink out in a mass of antimatter and matter when things started? So I think the more the public, as a, as a communicator, the more the public understand that the results don't flow out like some sort of timetable where you can... Like a train arriving at a platform. But they do come, and they are so essential to understanding who we are that they're worth waiting for. And that's the sales pitch, but... Um, Very good. Very uh, good. Very good. <laughs> I, think, I think that's what I take away from this. So uh, with that, I'd like to thank the audience, and I'd like you to join me in thanking our speakers today.